attempted to join last week. Um, I obviously messed up on the translation between Europe time and US time. So I want to talk with you today about how we can re reconstruct species biogeographic histories. And specifically, I'm going to talk about more or less reconstructions across the last 21,000 years, so not very deep time. Um, and there are three main ways that people have typically done this. I'll talk about each of these in turn. And then at the end, I'll talk about how we are attempting to statistically integrate these three different approaches so that we can have a more coherent picture of species histories. But to contextualize this research, I want to start with this person. This is Leonard von Post. He was a, a Swedish geologist in the early 1900s. He actually did not have his PhD, but he beat out several other people uh, who did have their PhDs in order to get his position. His big claim to fame was the invention of statistical paleontology, that is the study of historical pollen. And he realized that if we were to look at fossil pollen deposits, then that would enable us to, in a sense, reconstruct the history of the vegetation at a particular location. So I realize that many of you are probably familiar with these kind of diagrams. This is an old one, obviously, but the new ones don't look too, too much different from this. So I realize that many people are probably familiar with this, but I'm going to go across three different kind of modeling frameworks. And it's probably um, a safe bet that some people at least won't be familiar with all three of those. So excuse me if this is a little bit basic, but I, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So this is a fallen, fossil pollen diagram for phagus or beaches. And each one of these locations here represents a site. And you can see this is a map of, um, this is Southern Sweden, and then this is the province of Zealand in Denmark. So this is site F, and then one, two, three, four, and so forth. And this hashed area represents where modern day beaches, and you can see where fossil pollen was deposited in the past. So as you go down this, you uh, go deeper in time or deeper into the lake or the bog, in this case, um, the peat bog that was, um, that was cored. And uh, you'll see that there was fossil pollen all the way back to this line approximately here. This is about when the Bronze Age um, uh, began. And before that, we don't have beaches. So you can surmise that before that, the Bronze Age occurred Feet, uh, beaches were south of this location. And then as you go further north, you get an increase in pollen and uh, all the way up to about sites five or six, something like that, you see just little scant um, uh, of deposits of pollen. And after that, of course, you don't see it. So we can use fossil to pollen to decipher where species were in the past. And this is Leonard von Pote's very big innovation that we continue to use today. So that's observation number one. Observation number two, though, was made by this person. This is a British ecologist, a British plant ecologist, Clement Reed. And he was interested in how plants basically got to the British Isles. First of all, if you notice, obviously, there's this big channel between mainland Europe and the English Isles. He posited that uh, in the past that sea level rise had been lower, and therefore um, he called this area Dogger Bank. Uh, and he claimed that perhaps the species would have moved across the bank because it would have been land. And that's obviously probably how most of the species got across uh, to the English Isles after the glaciers retreated. However, Clement Reed also posited something else, which today we still don't have a solution to. And this is known as Reed's paradox. And unfortunately, I was not able to find a, a very pithy quote to encapsulate this. So I'm going to kind of paraphrase here. Basically says that most plants probably disperse about a yard in a year or about a meter in a year or something like that. And to get to the British Isles as they are right now, most plants would have had to have traveled about 600 or 800, 600 miles or about 800 kilometers or something like that, which, you know, given his estimate of dispersal rates, could have taken up to a million years. This became then known as Reed's paradox, which if I were to restate it, reads something like this. Species typical dispersal distances are very short, so how did they expand their ranges so rapidly during deglaciation? In other words, if we take the average dispersal distance of most species, they really shouldn't have the ranges that they have now. They should be much more restricted, much more in the northern hemisphere, um, uh, uh, packed more toward the south or more toward the, the equator. So this is the big question we're attempting to answer uh, in this talk. And by and large, people have used three different approaches to attempt to answer this question, plus any others related to species biogeographic um, histories, at least across, 
across the last 21,000 years. So these three different methods comprise uses of fossil pollen invented in a sense by Leonard von Post, uh, occurrence data used by species distribution models or ecological niche models, and then DNA, which is analyzed in many different ways, but generally using scenario kind of based models. Now, these three different approaches have been used in um, by themselves for a long time, but more recently, people have attempted to, um, to do some sort of integration between them. And uh, I think that's absolutely necessary because they each tell us different facets about a species history. Unfortunately, I would say that most attempts to integrate these three, or at least usually people integrate just two of these at a time. Most attempts to integrate these two different kind of data types or two or three different uh, approaches are very informal in a sense. And I want to give you an example of an informal integration. This is a little bit awkward because I'd like to pull out a, somebody's study and say, here, look, here's, uh, here's where somebody tried to integrate, but honestly, they basically integrated using their only, only their eyeballs. They looked at this and they looked at that and they said they look the same, so that's an integration. In a sense, it is, um, but it's not entirely uh, integrative in the way that we would like. So like I said, it's a little bit awkward. I don't want to call anybody out. So I decided to focus on one of a study that I was involved with, but I don't mean any kind of um, asperative aspect on my co-authors. They did an excellent job, but this is just an example of where integration could actually uh, really help, but we are not at this at the present time able to do it. So this is a case study of Delphinium, Delphinium exaltatum. It's a tall larkspur. Uh, it's an endangered plant in the United States. And my colleagues who did a genetic analysis found there are basically two different clades. There's what they call the lowland lineage and the Appalachian lineage. So the Appalachian lineage would be um, currently located in the Appalachian Mountains. And these two different lineages differentiated about 6,000 years ago, or sorry, about 6,000 generations ago. Now, my colleague was interested in the timing of this. Obviously, it's about 6,000 generations ago. But the problem is that in the literature, some people say this species has a generation time of one year. And some people say it has a generation time of three years. In other words, this split here about 6,000 generations ago could have occurred anywhere between 6,000 years ago and 18,000 years ago. And that's a really broad expanse of time. So she wanted to nail that down a little bit more and try to be more precise. So she asked me to construct some paleo species distribution models for the species. And here are some of the results of that. So um, I'm only going to focus on two time slices. <clears throat> Excuse me. The top row here is 10,000 years before present, and the bottom row is 15,000 years before present. And the left column represents the um, location of favorable climate for this lowland lineage. And you can see in the past, it was further south than where the species is right now. And the right column represents the suitable climate for the central Appalachian um, lineage. And right now it's generally focused um, where the Southern Appalachians are. But in the past, you can see the suitable climate was either really not so extant, or if it was, it was largely overlapping with that of the other lowland lineage. So based on this, we surmise that the, the development at least of distinct climate envelopes for these two different clades occurred somewhere around 12,000 years ago, which is an era of uh, major climatic change. Um, and so we surmise that actually the, uh, the, the generation time of the species is actually about two years, which is a nice compromise between what we saw in the literature. So this is a way in a sense that we have used to integrate across different data types. We had DNA, and then we have ecological niche models coupled with occurrences. And then we looked at them in different ways and said they tell more or less different sides of the, of the same picture. The problem with this kind of integration, though, is that it doesn't necessarily give us any sort of indication of which particular scenario is more likely. Um, perforce, this is based on what I'm showing you here on one particular paleo climate model. I also used another one, and the conclusions based on that one were slightly different. So which of these models is more correct? There's nothing in the data, as I can say, that would let us know which is better. There's also no way to, to enter us to estimate uncertainty. Like I said, we, at least based on this paleo climate model, they diverged about 12,000 years ago, but 
there's probably a plus or minus on that, and I'm not able to give you a, an, an uncertainty interval. Finally, there's no statistical connection between the genetics and the species distribution modeling. In other words, if the species distribution modeling had given us a completely different answer, the genetics would remain exactly the same and vice versa. So they're not really talking to one another. And this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying that so far, most of our attempts to integrate have been very informal, but there's not a statistical integration where one data type is, is in a sense talking to the other. So to address that, what I'm going to show you today is an attempt that we've been uh, working on <clears throat> that uses approximate Bayesian computation, or ABC, to enact the statistical integration. So to uh, illustrate our method, um, I want to focus on this species. This is green ash. It's a, you can see it's a very widespread species in North America. It's a large tree. Um, it is unfortunately, despite the fact that it's very widespread, it's actually critically endangered largely because of this little insect. This is emerald ash borer imported sometime uh, from Asia. It burrows under the bark and after a while it kills the tree. And it's been a real issue here, uh, even in my city here in St. Louis. Uh, the city tree department is going around and cutting down all these ash trees because when they die, of course, they could fall on houses and things like that. But it, it's really kind of left quite a few um, streets looking uh, far worse uh, with, with the lack of the trees. So it is a real issue here in the U.S. Um, but we'll be looking more at the paleo history, which was not impacted by this particular insect pest. So to make sure we also understand what has been going on in a sense for this species, plus all the others across North America, uh, uh, across the last 21,000 years. Um, this is a diagram I got from a paper where they're looking at um, uh, fossils of mammals in a cave in Texas, but I like the diagram, so I'm gonna use it here. So uh, the x-axis here represents temperature in Greenland. So if you go left, it gets colder. And the line, of course, is the temperature. And then they divided the time space into these four different kind of um, uh, sets. So they, uh, the last glacial maximum occurred, at least in North America, around 21,000 years ago. They labeled this whole time period the last glacial maximum. But regardless, you can see that although temperature did change, it didn't change dramatically until about 14 and a half thousand years ago when we uh, encountered what's known as the bowling alarod uh, period, which is probably um, onset by a change in the, the currents here, the Labrador currents between Greenland and North America. But whatever the cause, we do know that climate change uh, uh, occurred very suddenly. There was very sudden warming. And you can see the ice sheets uh, about 21,000 years ago were distributed down to here. But um, starting with the bowling alarod, then they melted very quickly. Uh, for a period of several thousand years. And then we entered what we know, what we call the Younger Dryas, or the YD here. Um, and the Younger Dryas was a very uh, glacial like period. It went back to a very cold period, again, shifts in the Labrador current. And then finally, we enter what we call the early Holocene. So, again, very rapid warming, and we go up to the present. So, this is all to say that if we look at um, climate, or what would you say, uh, biogeographic histories of species, we would probably generally expect to see dramatic changes of whatever kind somewhere in the bowling alarod or the younger dryas, or if there are kind of lag effects immediately thereafter in the early Holocene. And I'm just going to point this out because I'm going to label these periods later and uh, we'll look to see if there's signatures of that kind of climate change. So the first method I want to talk about in terms of integration is fossil pollen. And fossil pollen can be analyzed in a number of different ways. Be analyzed using uh, what we call smoothing models, pollen density models, or pollen vegetation models. And I'm going to walk through at least two of those. So this is the data we have for um, ash. Now, fossil pollen usually can only be resolved to the genus level. So we can't get green ash. We can only get Fraxinus, the genus. Um, but these are the cores, the locations of the cores. And you can see that there's a preponderance of uh, cores, fossil pollen cores, where Fraxinus is what we'd call abundant above a 5% level, um, mainly in these sites here and not so much down here in the south. And I just want to point this out because this will be important in a little bit for interpreting the results. So the first way that people have used to analyze fossil pollen is through these so-called smoothing models. And today they would be done in a, in a statistical sense using like a generalized additive model or something like that. But you can also do them by eye. And this is exactly what Margaret Davis did. She was a pioneer in this field. She basically looked at fossil pollen cores and then hand drew where she felt 
<clears throat> pardon, uh, where she felt the species had been located in the past. So the stippled area here represents the, um, the current range of ulmus or elms, the, the entire genus. And she posited that somewhere around 17,000 years ago, the species was located down here, 15,000 years ago here, 14, 13, 12, and so on and so forth. So this is the representation of a smoothing model. I do want to point out here that uh, even Margaret Davis was not quite sure exactly where the species were longer into the past down in the south. And by and large, that's a product of the fact that there's fewer cores down in the south. So this is an example of a smoothing model. But we can use more sophisticated techniques. And this is a, a polyagama stick breaking model. It's a, it's a fossil pollen density model where you're modeling the actual density of the species or the, the genus um, in the actual cores. So in this case, it's a um, multinomial model in the sense, meaning that each, well, you're familiar with most likely with a, a binomial model where you have like yes or no. There's a multinomial model where you have many different. Uh, taxa, I think about 10 or 12 or so. So each taxon has a, in a sense, a chunk of the space between one and zero. And you're modeling how much of that chunk is comprised of that taxon based on spatial location, based on location in time. So there's temporal auto location, or there's temporal um, uh, auto location. And this is a Bayesian model so that we can uh, get an estimate of the uncertainty around our. Um, our reconstruction to the species or that really of the taxons uh, by a geographic history. So um, I won't go more into this model, uh, but again, um, uh, if you're curious, uh, this is an unpublished man manuscript, but it will be soon to be uh, submitted. <clears throat> so I want to show you the output of this model. This is, like I said, it's a Bayesian model. So we have however many posterior draws we'd like, you know, 10,000 or something like that. But I'm just going to show you the output of the average um, spatial location of the fossil pollen through time. And to do that, I'm going to show you this animation. This is North America here, of course. The gray area, <clears throat> apologize for that, my throat here. Uh, the gray area represents the, what we're going to call the steady region. That is, Computationally, we were not able to do all of North America, and there are quite a few fraxinuses or species in the genus across North America. So we we focus mainly in the east, where there are fewer species of this uh, particular genus. This is the area weighted um, centroid, and I'm going to keep this dot here so you can see where, in a sense, the species or the, the genus started out. And I'm going to draw a line through time as the centroid moves. And of course, the, the glaciers are going to melt. So you can keep your eyes on this. I'm going to read off the time as we go. Let's start 20,000, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, Bowling Alarod, Younger Dryas, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So Perhaps what you saw there was that initially um, the species or the, really the taxon is moving northward and it's kind of bebopping around. And then there's dramatic climate change. There's large distances that are traversed by the centroid up until the present. And then it tends to move just slightly thereafter. So we can calculate or we can then plot the biotic velocities that is the speed that the centroid is moving through time. And that will look something like this. So across the x-axis, we have thousands of years before the present. And across the y-axis, we have what I'm going to call centroid biotic velocity. That is the speed that the centroid is moving. Now, technically, this isn't a velocity because it's really a speed. We're not talking about direction. So it doesn't matter if the centroid moves north or south or east or west. We're going to count that as a movement. So here's what we notice. Um, each of these bars represents the inner 90% of 200 draws from the posterior of that pollen vegetation model. So we get an estimate of uncertainty. You can see those uncertainties are really wide, especially um, in the past, further in the past. And that's perhaps reasonable to expect because we have fewer data from back then. Um, the cutting line seems to be the bowling aleride and the younger dryas. Once you go past them, we have much less uh, certainty in what was going on in the past. And 
that said, though, we don't really necessarily see signatures in botic velocity, the bowling aleride, or the younger dryas. That is, we don't see dramatic changes in these time periods compared to any of the others. Uh, this line here represents the botic velocity, if you want to call it that, of the land. In a sense, that's a, that's a, a null model. So it posits that if a species were distributed everywhere except under ice, this is the botic velocity that the species should have. But of course, you can see, although it corresponds only perhaps in this location right here, um, where uh, Fraxinus might have gone up and kind of met, in a sense, the border of the glacier or the ice sheet as it retreated, it really doesn't represent um, what was going biologically. So that gives us confidence that there is at least some biology in um, the signatures that we're seeing. Now, these uncertainties are very large because all we're using is fossil pollen. Um, but even then, if you focus on the median values of biotic velocities, these tend to be fairly high. And that's, um, that's fairly common across studies. That is, most studies find that if you look at velocities estimate from, estimated from fossil pollen versus ecological niche models versus genetics, fossil pollen usually outpaces, apparently, uh, the, the botic velocities of the other two by a factor of maybe four or five or something like that. So um, with this all said, you'll see that the major take home points are that uh, uncertainty tends to increase in the past. And even then, when we're looking at the present, the uncertainties tend to be fairly large and the rates of movement tend to be fairly high compared to other kinds of data. Now, we can not only look at centroid velocity, but also range margin velocity. So this is, in a sense, the velocity of the southern range margin and the velocity of the northern range margin. And what I'm doing, the way we're calculating this is we start at, remember the gray area here represents the steady region. We start at the southernmost cell and we, um, we sum up or we accumulate the amount of, in a sense, pollen density. Then we go to the next row of cells and we do a cumulative sum going row by row by row until we reach, in this case, the fifth quantile across the all the entire steady region. And we call that the southern range margin. And the reason why we do that is because these models never really predict exactly zero. So if you were just going to say if there's any location that has a zero, um, well, it's just simply not going to occur in the steady region. So the southern range margin would always be at the, the, the southernmost cell. So in other words, we're using the fifth quantile as you go up in latitude as our estimate of the southern range margin. And then the exact same thing, except for the, using the 95th quantile for the northern range margin. And we can look at the latitude of these lines as they move through time. And here I have them plotted. So here's the starting location of the northern range margin and then the ending location of the northern ring margin goes all the way up here. And you can see the southern one actually goes south a little bit uh, through time. So if we plot those, then we also see patterns that are indicative of the species responding to climate, or at least the taxon responding to climate. So this is northern margin velocity. This is southern margin velocity. And by and large, you can see they generally focus or they are generally centered around zero. But the y-axis here are, they are not meant to be comparable because um, it's a little bit hard to plot them all in one axis and see details. But, but the y-axis here, you can see these are fairly large numbers. So even this, even though it's very close to zero, represents a, a, a fairly large shift in space. Um, so again, uh, we have large uncertainties going into the past, and they don't necessarily mirror what we'd expect based on climate. So. Um, there are a couple other issues that are going on with the analysis of fossil pollen. You notice the fossil pollen um, density model predicts that the taxon was located up here in, um, in uh, middle in Canada. The species is not there. Now, the genus may be, but the species is not there. So we have a false positive in a sense. But we also have a false negative. So this, the model predicts that the, the taxon is generally not located in this location. Uh, but we do know at least this species, and I happen to know that other species of Fraxis happen to be located here. So the fossil pollen model is prone to false positives and false negatives. So part of the reason behind this is that, uh, as I pointed out earlier, most of the lakes that we have are located above the glacial terminus, and that is the, the southern um, location of last glaciation. And that's because the glaciers actually uh, created a lot of these lakes. 
as a result, we have a real paucity of data down here in the southern part of uh, the genus's range. And this tends to be a problem with any kind of fossil, fossil pollen analysis. A lot of people, when they do fossil pollen analysis, usually focus on this northern region because we have more data there. But it also means that we have uh, less ability to reconstruct the, the biogeographic histories of the species or the taxa in the more southern parts of their um, potential ranges. So in summary, fossil pollen is great, but there are sampling biases based on where the look at lakes are, and of course, where people go out and look at uh, the lakes. Um, you can usually only resolve fossil pollen to the genus level, which is a very kind of low level resolution. And then in the end, if you get pollen, what that means is that there was pollen there. It doesn't necessarily mean that the taxon was actually in the actual location. So you get lots of false positives and false negatives. <clears throat> So the second type of modeling framework I want to discuss is the one I'm much more familiar with. And this is using occurrence data. So museum data, herbarium data, and um, observational data, modern observational data. And we're plugging that into uh, species distribution models. Now I realize that many of you are very familiar with this, but again, I want to make sure that everybody is on the same page. So apologize, this is very basic. But a species distribution model or an ecological niche model basically does a mapping from geographic space, so these are occurrences of the species, onto an environmental space. And very simplistically, I've depicted this environmental space as one defined by temperature broadly and precipitation broadly. You can use many, many different variables. Use a model to, in a sense, draw a shape around these occurrences in environmental space, and then you can map that back onto a geographic space. Now, what does this represent? It really depends on the quality of the data and things like that. Um, too much for me to go into, but basically what it does is it indicates the climates, in this case we're using just climate as predictor, indicates the location of favorable climates, not necessarily location of the species, but location of climates that are favorable to the species. So that's how the, probably the, the safest way in a sense to interpret one of these sorts of models. So to analyze our green ash, I looked at two different climate models, the CCSM model and the EC built model. And they're by and large similar, of course, but you can already see differences um, graphically in terms of their, their temperatures. Um, and they do reflect sea level rise. So if we go back in the past, North America was larger because there is more land there. And then as sea level rose, uh, we, we uh, lose land in a sense. Um, and I used uh, 92,000 different modern occurrences, which is an incredible amount of data um, for one particular species. Uh, unfortunately, most of this data comes from a very intensive sampling survey done only in the United States, not in Canada, and less than 1% of all the, these 92,000 different records are found in Canada. So severely undersampled in Canada, and there are a couple US states that uh, for whatever reason, don't really participate in this program. So you can see that if you were an alien landing on Earth, looking in this map, you would believe in a sense that the species does not occur in this state, does not occur in this state whatsoever. Obviously, that's untrue, but um, that's an issue that we just have to deal with. So to model this species, um, I first of all use spatial thinning to reduce the sampling bias. Hopefully that helped correct it for the fact that there was far less data in Canada. Um, these states without samples are very low samples. I simply excluded any of the few records that were in them and also did not include any background points from those states. So we're just not presenting the model with that kind of data because it'd be a little bit misleading. Um, generally in the SDM community, people would posit that uh, you need to sample you need to have your absences, or in this case, your background sites, from locations that the species can sample, in a sense, through dispersal. The problem with that is that for most species, we don't really know what the dispersal, the true dispersal rate is, or range is. And to help accommodate that, I used three different buffers of 80, 160 kilometers, and 320 different kilometers, and drew the background sites from those locations. So. Um, <clears throat> and then I applied four different algorithms. So booster regression trees, which in a sense use tiny little boxes to, to approximate smooth curves around a species niche, generalized linear models, which can be as complex as you want, but um, generally tend to be simpler than other models. Natural splines, which are a form of um, generalized additive models, except they extrapolate in a sense in straight lines, they don't extrapolate in curves. Um, and then maxent, which is kind of a uh, mismatch of all of these. It can it can can recreate fairly complex shapes, but also very simple ones. 
So in summary, created 24 different models based on the crossing between three different background scents, four different SDM algorithms, <clears throat> and two different paleo climate models. And what I'm showing you here are maps of where the, these models, all these different scenarios, predict that the species was, or at least the climate that it prefers, 21,000 years ago. And by and large, the biggest difference is between the different climate models. So in the left set here, these are all based on the CCSM paleoclimate model, and the right set is based on the EC built climate model. And you can see <clears throat> more or less the CCSM model predicts that uh, the refugium was more in the south, closer to the coast, whereas the EC built model predicts that the refugium was more in the middle of our, our study region. It goes in the south a little bit, but not too much. So if we calculate the biotic velocity across all 24 of these models, this is the profile that we get. You notice the range here is much less than it was for a pollen model. And that's, like I said, um, because pollen tends to estimate very high rates of velocity. Um, again, we have years before present on the x-axis and centroid velocity along the y. And you can see here we have the bowling alarod period. Here's the younger dryas. We do, in a sense, see some signatures of these climate episodes. So we have our highest rate of movement, at least median movement, in the bowling alarod. And the younger dryas, in a sense, almost literally, things tend to freeze when things were very, very cold again. So the species was probably not moving very much. And then it picks back up until the present when the species kind of putters off and then it, it more or less uh, retains its current pro, um, uh, biogeographic profile. Here we have very similar uh, maps for the or plots for the northern range velocity and the southern range velocity. You can see the species moves north a little bit and um, then kind of uh, uh, zeroes out. And the southern range margin, then it moves north a little bit, positive values, and then becomes slightly negative. It moves slightly south uh, during that time period. So each of these bars represents the range across our 24 different species distribution models. We can ask then which one of these models or sets of models is the best. And honestly, there's really not a good answer to that. Now, uh, we can see why that is because, first of all, if we project our models back to 21,000 years ago, we do see these differences. But if we project them to the present, by and large, they basically recreate the species' present day range. So there's not a lot of differences between um, the present day predictions of these 24 different models. And indeed, if I calculated the accuracy of these models here, I'm using the continuous Boyce index, so higher values indicate more accurate models. And here are the different models. You can see, yes, there are differences between these models, but they're not incredibly different. None of these models are incredibly poor compared to the others. So we don't really have a firm basis for selecting this model over that model. So uh, in summary, um, species distribution models or ecological niche models are a very powerful tool. And yet, in the end, at least in the way we're using them here, they really only indicate the presence of similar environments, not necessarily present to the actual focal species. Um, they also have to deal with the fact that a lot of these models are trained on present-day climates, and there's no mo uh, past analog for those, uh, those, those present-day climates. And therefore, this, the, the model has to extrapolate, and that can always be an issue. And then finally, um, one of the big weaknesses I would say in this field is that there's just a lot of arbitrary decisions. And you can make these very defensively, but if you and I started out with the exact same data, we could end up with very different results based on these different decisions. You know, which paleoclimate model would we use? How do we correct for bias? What kind of background do we use? Which algorithms and so on and so forth. So um, there are issues with species distribution models uh, for using them to reconstruct species biogeographic histories. So the last model type I want to talk about is based on DNA. And in this case, we're going to look at scenario-based models. Um, so for green ash, this is the genetic landscape, in a sense, is the best map I could find of its genetics. More or less, it's divided into three different lineages. And a lot of North American trees don't have very strong signatures, but this seems to be the case for this, for this species. So you can see that there's, in a sense, this northern clade demarcated by the gray um, areas in the pies charts. There's a um, southern cluster, the white areas, and then what we call the kind of Atlantic cluster, the, the, the dark areas. So um, positing that in the past, perhaps there were three different refugia. Um, and uh, so this is data gathered by my colleagues, and we'll be using this 
and the rest of the analysis. So in summary, what we're positing is that in the past, there was some sort of refugium probably close to the margin of the glacier. We're not necessarily sure if it's east, west, or central across the range, something perhaps in the southwest and something perhaps in the southeast. So this is how we do a scenario-based modeling in this context for um, the biogeographic history of green ash. What we'd like to be able to write down is the likelihoods. So this is our, in a sense, our likelihood function. And the likelihood function to represent the likelihood of the number of refugia, location of the refugia, um, how much long versus short distance dispersal there were, carrying capacity, which here we're, we're using um, effective population size, the effective population size of the different refugia, um, the actual routes that the species took and things like that. So there are a hundred different things that we'd like to know. And as a result, it is just impossible for a human to write down this likelihood function. If we could, that would be awesome, but we just can't, we're not omniscient. So in the place of an analytical um, likelihood function, what we're going to do instead is simulate the species history across a large number of cases. We used about 100,000 different um, cases. And in each case, we're using different um, values for say number of refugia, uh, how much long versus short distance dispersal where there was, carrying capacity and so on and so forth. And then across those 100,000, we attempt, we look at how well each one of those recreates modern patterns of genetic diversity. And that can be FSTs, spare, um, pairwise FSTs, spatial autocorrelation genetics, so on and so forth. The idea being that if a model can better recreate those present day patterns, we have more faith in this ability to actually recreate those past patterns that we can't really observe. And we generally pick a very small number of models, say the top 1% or 0.1% um, that best recreate those patterns. And that's our estimate in a sense of a likelihood. So this is in a, in a nutshell, the explanation of what we call approximate Bayesian computation or ABC. So to analyze <clears throat> the species, what we did was we began with either one or three refugial locations. We did not uh, in our in our case, examine cases with just two refugial locations. And three, like I said, seems the most likely, at least genetically. Um, we'll then uh, start in these particular locations. And we're not saying that the species actually was hunkered down in these three locations, but approximately somewhere in the north, approximately somewhere in the southeast, and south, approximately somewhere in the southwest. We then allow dispersal to happen through time. And the dispersal is the product of two different kernels. One's a short distance kernel and one's a long distance kernel. And we vary the degree to which the model chooses one versus the other. And as we go through time, we allow population growth. The population growth is entirely deterministic. So it reaches its carrying capacity after a certain amount of time and so on and so forth. We do this across 21,000 years um, using a time interval of about 30 years, which represents the species generation time. Now, importantly, in this case, Every single site, except for those under ice, every single site we're assuming has the exact same carrying capacity. In other words, every site is equally suitable. So if a species can get there, it can grow a population. After we have the history of the colonizations, then on top of that, we simulate the species genetic history. And oddly enough, in this case, you start at the present and you go back in time. So it's a backwards time uh, kind of simulation. And this is based on coalescent simulation. So if you're not familiar with these, in a sense, what you have is say three different clades might be represented by you know, the, the colors here. They have different genetics, but at some point in time, based on mutations, things like that, they all had a single common ancestor. So you estimate this back through time based on the connections between the cells from the demographic simulations over here. Um, and this time of coalescence may have been far, far long before the last glacial maximum. So maybe um, when we start our demographic simulations, uh, that time period could be say something around here, um, but the, the time of actual convergence was far before that. And we can estimate that um, through um, this approximate Bayesian computation. So, the outcome we get from this, looking at uh, biotic velocity of just, just uh, information based on genetics, looks like this. So here representing each of these bars represents the biotic velocity through time, and the range represents um, the 95 or the inner 90th 
quantile across the 0.1% of models that best recreated present day patterns of genetics. And what I'm showing you here are results based on the three refugia, not just the single refugia. Um, <clears throat> sorry, so keep in mind again, that we're assuming that the landscape is equally suitable for the species across all time. And perhaps not surprisingly, you see that biotic velocity initially is a little bit slow and then it picks up. And then more or less, it, re it, it remains constant through time until you get to the present. Because there's nothing in a sense other than the glaciers holding the species back from expanding. And once it hits that glacial margin, then it just kind of follows pace through time. And the same thing exactly happens with the northern range margin and the southern range margin, not, not very dynamic. And we don't see any imprints, say, of the bowling alarod or the younger driest period. So in a nutshell, the power of genetics is in a sense offset by the fact that you can have the same kind of genetic patterns, but they can produce by different processes. And so it's hard to differentiate one process from another based on just patterns. Uh, the way I've instituted this here, we don't account for our differences in habitat suitability. All sites are equally the same. Um, and it's also very difficult to locate uh, refugia confidently. Like I said, we, we, we had to put a point on the map to say where the refugium were, but we don't have high levels of confidence the refugium was actually right there. It could have been slightly north or south or, or something like that. So now to end, what I want to do is walk you through a statistical integration of these three different kinds of analysis for re reconstructing species biogeographic histories and uses the exact same machinery I've already talked about, but with one little minor innovation. So as you recall, this is our likelihood function. We'd like to be able to write this down. We can't do that. So we simulate it and then you pick the top, you know, 0.1% of models that best recreate those, um, uh, the species current by uh, genetic patterns. The operative word here is models. And like I said, we simulate these in the naive genetic kind of context, assuming that all these locations are equally suitable to the species. So to integrate information from pollen or the SDMs, what we can do simply is take these surfaces and plug them in here and then use these as an index of the carrying capacity. So if we're focused on this SDM, say, we would say that even though the species might be able to disperse to these gray locations, the suitability is so low that the species would not survive there, and so it can't have populations there. So in a sense, we're keeping the, the genetic demographic simulations in check through time based on the estimated suitability to the species. And these are the results of that. So the top row is all the graphs that you've already seen. So this is for pollen, this is for species distribution models, and this is for the genetics only model. Um, and again, the y-axis here is the centroid velocity. Now, the y-axis here are, are different scales for the pollen compared to the others, but they're scaled the same. So a value of 400 meters per year should fall about right here. So you can actually compare them. We just had to make this taller because pollen uh, velocities tend to be so much higher. So like I said, these are the, in a sense, the non-integrated results. But when we add in the genetics and then we pick the different pollen models or the different SDM models that help best recreate those patterns of present day genetic diversity, we can see a couple different things. First of all, dramatic reduction in uncertainty. So we go from very wide intervals to very narrow intervals for pollen and for SDMs. Um, for genetics, there's not a I mean, when there's not a, a, an integrated model per se, that is, it's this model and this model. So that's why there's no plot down here. So dramatic in, uh, reduction in uncertainty. It also increases what I would say the plausibility. You, you notice here, a lot of these medians are very close to one another, given the error bars, um, meaning that would say that pollen or this, the taxon was marching across the landscape more or less at a constant rate. But here we have much more variation that seems to be in line not necessarily with um, the climate periods that we'd expect, but it seems to be a, a little bit more plausible. Um, so this is the centroid velocity, and we can also do that for the range margin velocities. I'm just going to show you the ones for the northern range velocity. So this is where the northern range um, margin is moving, and positive values means that it's moving northward, and negative values means that it's moving southward. Again, we see dramatic reduction in uncertainty. And again, it seems a little bit more plausible. So initially, according to pollen, at least, the species would have moved south, the northern, the northern range margin would have moved south, and then it went north again and so forth. 
for um, based on the SDMs, we don't see any kind of southern movement, generally a northern war, uh, march, but again, a dramatic reduction in uncertainty. This approach also allows us to estimate other parameters. Um, I'm just going to walk through two of these. This is an estimate of the carrying capacity, and but here we're, we're using uh, effective population size, but I'm going to call it carrying capacity. Carrying capacity of each individual cell at its maximum, assuming it has a, a suitability of one. So uh, across these 100,000 models, we allow each one of them to pick randomly a carrying capacity between, uh, I think, one and, uh, and 10,000. And this is what we call the prior. Uh, now used a smoothing algorithm to show the density of these uh, draws. Um, so it, it looks like it tapers off here, but it really is actually flat. So you can ignore the line kind of down tick here. If we, um, as we pick our models that best re recreate present day diversity, we can see that the posteriors in a sense, that is the values that these best models tend to pick gets tighter and tighter. So if we pick say just the top 10% of models that's here shown by this very thick line, it's not as smooth as the prior line. So we're, we're in a sense learning something. If we pick the top 5% of models, it gets less smooth, uh, two and a half percent. And finally, the, the top 0.1% of these 100,000 models um, would suggest that the carrying capacity is somewhere in the range of about 2,000 individuals. We do that for the species distribution models, we get qualitatively fairly similar results. The species distribution models would estimate that the um, NCB in a particular cell would be somewhere around, oh, you can eyeball that, but maybe 750 or so. So this allows us then to estimate things that we wouldn't normally have been able to estimate using just pollen or just SDM or perhaps even just genetics. We can also do that for um, something of long interest directly related to Reed's paradox, and that is looking at the proportion of uh, dispersal events that are long distance. Now, in the pollen model, what we found was that um, basically it said there's no long distance dispersal whatsoever across all the different draws, and no matter how tightly you constrain that final set of models that you select, they would always say that there's no long distance dispersal at all. It's all short distance dispersal. The SDMs, however, give a slightly different picture. They would say that um, somewhere about two and a half percent of all dispersal events are these long distance dispersal events. And that might help explain then Reed's paradox of how fast species were able to migrate after the last deglaciation. So in summary, there are some very powerful approaches for reconstructing species biogeographic histories based on fossil pollen, occurrence data, and DNA. By and large, when people have integrated, and I'm guilty of this too, when people have done what we call integrative um, research, what they've done is integrated by I. So they said these two look the same, and I'm going to call them the same. But statistically, these different data types in this sense aren't talking to each other. And hopefully what I've shown you is a method forward by which we can actually allow one to talk to each other and inform the, the final results. And this is important because each of these data types and each of these methods of analysis have different strengths and weaknesses. Like I've shown you, fossil pollen is prone to false positives and false negatives. ENMs have their own issues. DNA can tell you something, but not everything. Therefore, we need a way for these different data types analyses to actually statistically talk to one another. And uh, finally, formal uh, integration allows us more precise integration, or sorry, more precise estimation. So you can see the dramatic dropping in those error bars. So where are we going with this? Well, right now, Andrea Dawson and I are working on an integrated species distribution model, pollen density model. So you would include pollen and present day occurrences to help further constrain the species estimates. Um, and then we're also looking for ways that we can incorporate other kinds of data. Maybe there's macro fossils you could help kind of fasten the uh, simulations to, or different kinds of DNA. So paleo DNA or sedimentary DNA, that kind of thing. All kinds of information out there that could be used in this modeling framework. It's very, very flexible. So that's where we're going with this. So this is the end of my talk. I do want to note two different uh, softwares that you may be interested in. First of these is the, um, the software used to simulate the demographic simulations and then the coalescence simulations. And you can find this on GitHub. It's currently being documented. So 
give us um, a couple more weeks, maybe, and we'll have all the documentation done. But if you're interested, um, you can install it using these commands right here. So it does the, the demographic simulations and the coalescence simulations, and you can imprint on them if you want uh, some sort of suitability surface, say, from, from an ENM or a pollen vegetation model or something like that. The other function I want to call out is the sporadic velocity function. I spent a lot of time uh, on this function, so it'd be great if it could be used a little bit more. I've only shown you some of the results based on the biotic velocity function. Of course, it does centroid velocity, uh, but you can also do these range quantiles. So like I looked, like we looked at the northern range margin, the southern range margin, or eastern or western, or whatever you're interested in. You can also differentiate, in a sense, range spreading versus shifting. You can imagine that you know if you have a say a cup of water and you pour it in a floor, it's going to expand. You wouldn't necessarily call it a shifting, but it's an expansion. So you can kind of differentiate that from actual movement of the range. Um, you can look at their metrics for looking at asymmetry and how the range is shifting. Maybe just the northern part is moving, the southern part is staying foot. And then sometimes maybe ranges don't move per se, but abundances do. So you can look at similarity, similarity metrics through time and how those shift. So. Uh, in a nutshell, that's what we're interested in doing. And um, in the future, looking forward to collaborating with people with different kinds of data sets of whatever kind. And they don't necessarily have to be paleo. Uh, they can also be more contemporary. For example, if you're looking at uh, routes of invasion of invasion species and something like that, this framework is really set up for, for examining um, how those might be incorporated. So thank you very much.